Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start. And um, I just want to give a little introduction to what we're doing here. And um, before I introduce Rose, and I just want to say hello and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Druno, representing the Garden Friendly Community Committee of Fort Bragg. We're a small team of community organizers on the coast who are dedicated to helping grow a strong home and community gardening culture here in Fort Bragg. I'd like to welcome you to our special presentation by guest author and garden historian, Dr. Rose Hayden Smith, titled Victory Gardens for a New Era. Before I introduce Dr. Rose, I would like to mention a few things. This is brought to you by the Garden Friendly Community Effort in Fort Bragg. In 2019, we passed a resolution declaring Fort Bragg the first garden-friendly community in the world. This was done to recognize the importance of home and community gardening to our coast and also to create a foundation for starting more gardens and protecting those gardens as we move into a more localized, diverse, abundant, and sustainable future. We are working currently on three community gardens in Fort Bragg and will soon be asking for volunteers and folks who would like a plot or would like to get involved. You can join our garden friendly community network by emailing gfcgardensfortbragg at gmail.com. I'll be posting that and a number of other links in the chat so you guys can check there. Um, and I also wanna let you know that we've opened a fundraise, fundraising campaign on GoFundMe. And you can find the link here in the chat also or email us for more information. This presentation is a celebrated opening of our GFC sponsored events. Join our network and invite friends as we continue to bring you interesting garden-related and inspirational presentations from amazing people like Dr. Rose. Our next event will be a three-part film series titled In Nuestras Manos, sponsored by Ecology Action in Patagonia and the GFC Garden-Friendly Community Committee, documenting small-scale biointensive farming and gardening projects around the world. This video series will be followed with a Q&A session with director Matt Anderson and myself, and we will take you through amazing community-based farming and gardening work being done in Kenya, Peru, Mexico, Nicaragua, and beyond. The link will also be posted here in chat. So today we are here to welcome Dr. Rose Hayden Smith and her presentation, Victory Gardens for a New Era. This presentation will be followed with a brief Q&A session with our guests, so please save your questions till the end and use the chat. I will be moderating these questions and grouping questions that are similar, and I will share them with Dr. Rose Hayden Smith after her presentation, and she'll respond. So without further ado, I would like to say that we are so excited and honored to introduce Dr. Rose Hayden Smith. She is an Emeritus Cooperative Extension Advisor with the University of California. She is the creator of the UC Food Observer, a blog about food and agriculture. She has served as the director of 4-H programs in Ventura County, coordinated the Master Gardener program as the officer's first female county director, and has developed programs for youth and adult extenders in food systems and agricultural literacy. She also serves as strategic initiative leader in sustainable food systems for the University of California a &R. Her passion for garden-based learning and youth and community gardening and perspective as a U.S. historian has led her to become a nationally recognized expert in the history of Victory Gardens and federal policy relating to agriculture and education. She authored the book, Sowing the Seeds of Victory, American Gardening Programs of World War I, published in 2014 by McFarland Press. I got a copy right here. And I gotta say, I love this book and find inspiration in it each time I pick it up. I would highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in the history of Victory Gardening and who shares an interest in understanding how we can create a more local, and resilient food system in response to the challenges we face as a rural and underserved community in challenging times. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Rose. And I'm gonna go ahead and mute here and hand it over to you. So thank you. Oh, Matt, that was so nice. And I wanna thank you for inviting me. Um, Matt and I have been corresponding and um, you know for several months and have had um, a wonderful um, Zoom meeting during that period. And I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, I, I want to tell you that um, I am doing this from um, my back patio in an, in an urban area. I live in Ventura, California, hometown of Patagonia. 
Many of my neighbors work in Patagonia. Um, but it's, you know, it's noisy and there just aren't many places where I can go and be really quiet. So I apologize for any sort of um, background noise, but I do want you to know that I'm in the place in my home that gives me the most inspiration, which is sort of you know, um, I've got gardening stuff around me. So it's really nice to be with you. So we find ourselves in this really odd time. Um, and, you know, it's, we're in a crisis and, and there are multiple crises and I don't have to tell you about that. And it's, it's really interesting because I, I'm, um, I'm a, I'm a practitioner. Um, I, I spent literally three decades doing school, home, and community garden work um, as a practitioner, but I'm also simultaneously a historian uh, about this topic, and as a World War I historian in particular, um, the sort of um, pandemic crisis we find our, ourselves in feels very familiar to me as a topic of study. So, uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the history, but also weave it into to what's going on, you know, today with the food system. So, you know, America has this um, really interesting history in terms of our relationship with land, um, right? I mean, we were in many ways, we perceive ourselves as a nation of farmers, right? And um, as agriculturalist at origin. And so, it, you know, that's a kind of interesting history. Um, you know, I, this image that's on this first slide, and I'll, I'm gonna, I'll digress every now and then to uh, talk to you a little bit about the images. Um, I've got a chapter in my book about um, posters and propaganda that's actually proven to be pretty timely. Um, so this image right here, I know that you recognize it. A lot of us when we were kids, we saw this, uh, this image in a textbook, um, except it said the spirit of, 70, of 76, right? 1776. And instead of um, you know, men carrying food, um, they were revolutionary soldiers remember they were rebelling against the um the british and they were carrying muskets and the little boy there was drumming rather than carrying food but this is an example of the sort of imagery that arose in world war one and world war ii around gardening efforts um, but again a little history um, we have a strong tradition in this country of kitchen gardens right um, as just sort of a way um, historically to augment um, family food security uh, for many women, um, especially women in agricultural settings, you know, farm wives, kitchen gardens um, became a way for them to enter the market economy, right? And to start their own little side business, very prosperous, really helped out family economy. Um, in 1893, uh, you know, we had um, an economic downturn in this country that was pretty significant. Called the, called, it was called the Panic of 1893, and basically, uh, you know, the economy tanked, and we'd we had a real issue um, arise in terms of um, food security. And it led to a lot of civil unrest in urban areas because in that time, we didn't have um, any sort of social safety nets, right? There was not unemployment insurance or anything like that. Um, you know, living conditions in cities were pretty bad. And you had um, lots of immigrants and factory, you know, factory workers crammed together um, in housing and, you know, they're losing their jobs. They're, you know, falling out of work. So um, there is a real issue with potential for civil unrest. So in Detroit, there was a socialist mayor, the first socialist in American history, elected mayor of a city. His name was Hazen Pingree. And he and his group of thinkers, which included faith leaders and civic leaders, they and even business leaders, they came together and they came up with a model um, that later became um, called the, you know, potato patch model or, you know, something like that. And, and there were different terms for it. And basically, um, vacant land was provided, training and materials were provided to these urban dwellers so that they could garden 
and, you know, sort of ease the tension in the situation. And it worked. It was really successful. And the sort of tropes that people had about, you know, how we are in this country about poverty, right? That, you know, that poverty is pathology, which we, we know is not true. But um, that model disproved that. And, and people learned learned how to garden, and it spread across the United States. And um, by 1893, there was actually, well, within about a year, there was um, a National Vacant Lot Cultivation Association. So it spread. It was very, very popular. Um, and there were lots of um, garden programs. And this sort of also fed into the whole thing about progressivism. And when I look at where we are now, um, you know, before the progressive era, which is, you know, sort of like the late 1890s through about 1920, and you could even say that the New Deal, the, the you know, that era is, is sort of like a, a lasting impulse of progressivism. Um, there was something called the Gilded Age, right? Robber barons. We are in a Gilded Age right now, right? And so I'm hopeful that we'll have a, a progressive era that follows it. But you have to understand that this progressivism really drove these programs in World War I. So, you know, there was a really robust school garden movement in the United States um, prior to World War I. Very robust. School gardens were everywhere. There was a lot of literature about them. There were books about how to do it. Um, in California, where I live, um, the University of California partnered with the Berkeley School District. And, you know, there was even a kid's farmer's market in Berkeley where kids could, in school or home gardens, bring what they produced, sell it, right? And there was even a little banking system they set up. There was also the City Beautiful movement that, that, um, that sort of fed into this, this idea that urban areas could be uplifted by gardens and then kind of like the work of Frederick Law Olmsted and how that sort of, you know, the park, city park movement. There was also the Country Life Commission, which if you've never read about that, boy, go find um, something to read about it or I can make some recommendations to you. And that was really interesting because that was um, a sort of Teddy Roosevelt thing that, um, brought together national thinkers who really, um, th there was a perception that there was a huge urban rural divide, which is kind of the where we are now, like the blue and red state thing. And um, so that is a really interesting impulse, increasing urbanization, immigration. I mean, at the outset of World War I, about 20% of people living in this country were immigrants. There was also this national movement towards agricultural education and the Cooperative Extension Service. Many of you know about Cooperative Extension 4-H, master gardener, technical assistance to farmers. That was done through legislation called Smith-Lever in 1914. There was also the professionalization of science, particularly around gardening, because um, landscape gardening actually initially was kind of in the domestic or female sphere. And then it got professionalized as, as men, like Homestead came in and um, so you have like landscape programs starting in colleges and uh, professional forestry programs, things like that. Another thing that fed into this was actually the suffrage movement. And um, if I've got a chapter in my book about that, about um, actually there were lots of women's horticultural schools. And there was one in particular um, in the Philadelphia area, which it, I, I visited because um, when I was a kid, because it was right near where um, I was raised. And uh, those women there actually used their work in agriculture to press for suffrage. So there was a lot going on, you know, prior to World War I. So we enter the war in 1917, and you know, the war's been going on for a few years in Europe, and um, this leads to a rise of uh, what were first called liberty, later victory garden movements. And and, you know, the model was not American, right? It was, um, you know, done by the British. It was done by the Canadians. But we took it and 
and we did some sort of unique things with it. So uh, we entered the war in April. And in, in his address to Congress declaring war on Germany, Woodrow Wilson says food will win the war. Food will win the war. And so look at this little poster. Uncle Sam says garden. Um, it, you, it's hard to see, but right here, where I'm moving my cursor, that actually says city garden, then there's farm garden. And if you look in the background, right there, what they're gardening, it's in the shape of an American flag. I think that's kind of interesting. So the U.S. starts a national program, and it promotes school, home, community, and workplace gardens, and they are positioned as essential to national security. It wasn't actually the federal government that did it alone. It was a massive public-private partnership. And one of the biggest proponents for the program was um, a very wealthy businessman and philanthropist named Charles Lathrop Pack. And he really had this grand vision of what this could look like. And then you've had people like Herbert Hoover, who had been um, doing war relief work in Belgium, and he is also a friend of Woodrow Wilson's, and that's how we actually get the Food Administration. And so there are all these different groups coming together with this common purpose for different reasons, but for national gardening. So um, this is a poster, War Gardens Over the Top. You can imagine it's it's targeted to kids, and um, obviously it's over the top, trench warfare, right? So it's trying to recruit kids for a program called the United States School Garden Army. This poster was created by um, a noted children's illustrator named Maginal Wright Barney, and she was famous. And kids everywhere would have recognized her work and would have been drawn into it. She was also Frank Lloyd Wright's sister and um, had a really long and sort of illustrious career. So the goals of this program in World War I were to prevent civil unrest. So America, you know, when we entered the war, it was not a country that was at peace in its, you know, within itself. And in fact, so many of the things that are going on now remind me of um, what I've studied as an historian, um, you know, uh, incredible race tensions, labor tensions, um, inequality in income and in circumstance. You have whole groups of people that are disenfranchised from the vote, including women that are pushing for this. Um, I mean, it, it was an absolutely um, chaotic and violent time in our country. There um, were also pressures because of the large Im immigrant population, so tensions um, around that. And um, there, you know, so the, the government was very concerned about the potential for riots in cities and civil unrest. Um, and Americans were not all on board with going to the war. There was a lot of resistance to, um, to going to war with Germany. Um, there were also uh, ag labor shortages because the U.S. did a draft. And one of the things that I, I think we all forget is how unprecedented this draft in World War I was. Um, the U.S. at the outset of World War I had a standing army um, of about half a million, and it wasn't even really a standing army. That was sort of like National Guards and state militias because the U.S. was sort of founded on this idea that we didn't like standing armies because we broke off from the British, and one of the things, the big points of tension was um, having a standing army um, you know, on American soil and the quartering of troops. So Americans had been very averse to standing armies. Um, World War I, too, we, we, we sent troops abroad. And in American history, prior to World War I, um, we didn't really send troops abroad. I mean, you might have small groups of Marines, like a few hundred men going here or there to fight internationally to secure mostly American business interests. Let's be real.
all. But um, for us, we, we go from this very, you know, sort of small, loosely organized, um, you know, military presence to um, drafting three million men and sending like one and a half million abroad to fight. And that led to ag labor shortages on the home front because you're drafting men. And there was an exemption for farmers, but many farmers didn't take it, right? They wanted to be, you know, prove their patriotism. Uh, the community I live in now, Ventura, had a lot of farmers who were of German descent. And they they didn't claim exemptions. They went and fought to prove their loyalty, right? Um, we also had to feed the troops and we had to feed our European allies who were starving because the uh, European home front was essentially a battlefront. And this idea too that gardening um, could strengthen democracy, right? And that it could um, bridge and gap the differences, the acute societal and cultural differences in American life. And I actually believe that. I believe that that is true now, right? That it, it, it bridges, it bridges. Um, and that's an important thing that we actually need more of right now. So there were more goals. One of them to, it was to reduce the food mile. So we think that the term food mile as being um, really modern. It's not. This is actually appeared in World War I literature because um, there was concern about having to use trains because we didn't like have a national highway system, right, to transport food. So the idea was that if you could boost local food um, production and consumption, that you would would then, um, you know, take pressure off the train system so that it could get food to troops and also could be shipped abroad. There was also a concern about teaching youth about food. Um, more than 100 years ago, there was a national concern that our increasingly urbanized population, that kids were disconnected um, from their food system. And, you know, you think about it, the 1920 census is the first census in American history where um, we have a majority of urban dwellers, right? So the country is changing from really, a, a, you know, predominantly rural and shifting into urban. Um, so, and this poster too is another Maginal Wright Barney poster, follow the Pied Piper, join the United States School Garden Army, and um, look at in the, sh in the background, that is the landscape as an American flag. Um, look at the, this is just a beautifully rendered um, poster. There was also interest in improving nutrition and health and mobilizing citizens because people were not on the same page. And so gardening effort could do it. So this booklet is a 32 page booklet that you could write away for, and it was free of charge, it was distributing in communities, and it's a gardening guide. And um, they were, this booklet was adapted for regional growing conditions. It's got plans, right? Like, you know, here's what you plan in your fall garden. Here's what you do in the winter. Here's what you do in the spring and the summer. And lots of great um, instruction about food preservation too. The reason I'm sharing this image with you is that look at who it's coming from. I mean, the letter encouraging you to garden is coming from the Secretary of War. I think that's really interesting. There was a woman's land army um, that um, was part of the program, the national program, that um, recruited about 20,000 um, largely urban and suburban women many of them college co-eds, um, to basically go be ag labor. And these women organized their own um, labor camps. It was a whole women-run operation, and they would contract out to farmers. And it was kind of interesting. In California, they issued a labor manifesto, and they secured rights in California, including a minimum wage, a set work week, and housing decades before um, migrant farmers were able to do it. It's really an interesting dynamic. And look at this beautiful poster. Um, I like this poster a lot because if you look at the women's hair, it sort of is foreshadowing the flapper era in the 20s. They're wearing um, pants. Look at them. They're not even wearing skirts. They're wearing pants. This is a very edgy um, poster. This is a U.S. school garden army poster, 
And um, the young boy is, you can tell he's an urban boy. He's wearing um, a newsboy cap. Look at his little tie, his American uh, flag. And then you, it's hard to see, but he's got a school garden insignia here. And um, you could register your war garden, right? Um, under the protection of the State Council of Defense. Um, if you destroyed someone's war garden, that was actually a crime, a misdemeanor that could be prosecuted and was prosecuted in some places. There was also vacant lot cultivation, the idea that property laws, private property laws were eased somewhat so that um, people could garden on easements like railroad easements, utility easements, um, you know, even private property. Property. So I want you to look a little bit about the, at this. Be a soldier of the soil. Exempt no land. The idea that there's a draft, there are draft exemptions, but that no vacant land should go uncultivated. Food will win the war. Um, and it's kind of interesting. And this United States School Garden Army, this is a super interesting and could inform our work going forward, I think. Um, it was the first national curriculum through the Bureau of Education. And I think that says a lot. It targeted urban and suburban kids. Um, it was sort of softly mandated. But one of the most significant things about it is that it was funded um, by Woodrow Wilson, by an executive order using funds from the War Department. That's how essential it was viewed as being to national security. So imagine if we could take um, monies that are going to um, Department of Homeland Security, for example, uh, money that's going to um, munitions and arms. And if we could take that and shift our thinking the way it was in World War I, where gardening was viewed as being essential um, to national security because human health is your true national security. So that's one of the sort of more radical things about these programs, I think. These programs were a huge success. I mean, they were ubiquitous. These gardens were everywhere. And by 1918, because of the wonderful food conservation messages in addition to home production that was increased, the U.S. had been able to export three times as much grain, wheat, sugar as before the war. And the gardens, again, were everywhere, everywhere. So, um, you know, it's something to look at. So then, you know, we go into a depression. And I know that, um, you know, people think of, you know, the Depression is sort of like 1929, but actually for rural areas in America, the Depression hit right after World War I. It was like a full 10 years of a rural depression in America um, because, you know, World War I was kind of a golden age for American agriculture because we didn't have a lot of competition because our European allies were not really producing and there was um, a wheat blight in Russia. So we were like, you know, on the stage, you know, shipping food all over the world. But in the Depression era, there was, um, there were a lot of gardening things. There was a, a federal program that was like an emergency relief program that actually provided millions of dollars for gardening. There were city relief um, efforts. There is a really interesting model that um, emerged in the Depression that I think could be looked at again, which were basically subsistence urban homesteads that were created. And these were like small farms and city farms and um, mostly an acre or less. And the families were given technical assistance so that they could do um, chicken, you know, pretty large scale gardening, um, small livestock. And it's really interesting because if you go to places in um, Los Angeles, um, county, there are still communities where you can see these massive lots, right? Um, and, you know, and that's what those were. And the 30s, of course, and the Great Depression, you know, basically marks the remaking of our food and agriculture into the modern food system. And many of the sort of um, federal systems that we have set up 
um, things like subsidies. I mean, they've been modified over time, but the basic architecture of that stuff is, is from the 30s. And we really need to revisit it in this country, right? I mean, um, the, the program in the 30s, um, it really, it, it pushed, it, it really favored large and favored consolidation, and it pushed lots of small farmers off the land, and it really, um, really dispossessed um, uh, black farmers in this country. And, um, but that was sort of the beginning of our modern food system. So then we go into World War, uh, World War II, entirely different deal, right? So victory gardens are a huge thing, but the program is started by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And within just a couple of weeks of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Department of Agriculture convened um, all sorts of people nationally at a conference in Washington, D.C., which was a war garden defense conference. And they laid out an entire plan that involved urban, rural, kids. Um, there was a women's land army, but the women's land army in World War II was mostly farm women who were basically taking over, um, you know, farm management um, as male members of their family, um, you know, were drafted or um, enlisted. And, um, you know, the thing about the World War II draft is that, um, you know, we drafted ultimately about 10 million men. I mean, it was like three times the size of World War I. Um, and um, it, it, there were some really interesting things that, that came out of it. And um, I don't have time for it today, but um, one of the things that's really interesting that we should all consider is that it's, it's really war that drives a, a lot of the technical advances in food. And so things like um, canned milk were, you know, driven by, um, you know, war, wars, you know, that happened in Europe and, you know, what, the 1830s, 1840s. And so, you know, you have soldiers in the Civil War in America, you know, having access to canned milk, you know, um, MREs, things like um, instant coffee, um, stuff like that. You know, a lot of the advances in food technology are driven by war. And I, one of the things that's also really interesting about World War II is that, you know, World War I, America really stepped onto the international stage as the sort of massive food producer, right? And in World War II, that was also the case. Um, there are some interesting things about um, how we even created consumers by what GIs carried in their backpack to share in areas that were liberated, right? Like Hershey's, you know, chocolate bars, instant coffee. Um, there have been some really interesting articles um, written about um, like Coca-Cola, cola bottling plants, you know, coming in as GIs are liberating, you know, so that Americans, um, soldiers can have Coca-Cola and, you know, we can have new markets for food. Um, but in World War II, the Victory Garden on the home front, absolutely about increasing local food production, mobilize citizens to grow food, even in cities improve health. And in fact, one of the big things that the federal government emphasized in World War II is that these victory gardens were about nutritional defense. That is the term, nutritional defense. Because when you do drafts, you get a census of male health and by extrapolation, a census of national health. And American dietary health was not great. Um, so that was that. There was also the Victory Gardens as a means to encourage um, storage and preservation and reduce food costs because we're coming off, um, you know, a depression. So here's Vice President Henry Wallace and his Victory Garden at the VP residence in August 1942. His son looks really interested, right? Um, another thing, too, that if you don't know about Wallace is Wallace was the Secretary of Agriculture in the Great Depression, who was the architect of New Deal agricultural policies. He was um, Roosevelt's first vice president. 
And um, he is, um, his father was also um, an ag secretary in the United States. Um, they're the only sort of uh, father-son team that have both held the position. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is very, very interesting. Um, it was created as a cabinet level agency by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. We were one of the first countries in the world to have agriculture um, be a cabinet cabinet level position and the USDA secretary is um, in the presidential succession in case you didn't know that. So here's a food commandments poster. This is absolutely probably my favorite poster. Um, it appeared in World War I, was reused in World War II. Um, it has a lot of messages for us today. People always ask me if this is a mocked up poster because of item number four, buy local foods. Now, this is from World War I. This is more than 100 years ago. So again, World War II Victory Garden, iconic home front mobilization program. 20 million gardens in 1943. It's estimated that three out of every five U.S. families gardened. 40% of the fresh fruits and vegetables that were consumed um, on the American home front in 1942-1943 were produced in school, home, community, or workplace gardens. Um, billions of jars of preserved food, um, you know, and uh, these were just iconic. I remember talking to my dad one time, and he was um, a young child in World War II, and he remembers vividly their, their victory garden, right? Um, so what's happened since, right? So post-World War trends, we sort of go from regional to national cuisine. And part of that has to do, again, with this um, great mixing in our country and the sort of um, in-migration caused by both World War I, but particularly World War II. And so, um, you know, when you're re drafting military men, millions of men from all over the country, um, you know, a lot of people who were in the military may not have had exposure to Italian food. So um, what do they do? That's where you get like Chef Boyardee, which is not really Italian, but it's someone's idea of Italian. So this sort of national cuisine. Um, we have improvements to the food system. Um, one of the big improvements is um, a national highway system, right? And that's, um, that's Eisenhower. And Eisenhower pushes this uh, legislation because um, he remembers from World War I as a young officer that one of his um, tasks was to test road readiness. And um, so he set out with a convoy of folks, um, you know, basically, I think they started in Maine, ended up on the West Coast, and went, oh my gosh, we don't really have a national highway system, roads are terrible. So that national highway system is a game changer, right? And that enables the strawberries that are produced two miles from my home in January and February to be in D.C., right, in the winter. There are also societal changes, like the rise of suburbs and lawns. Um, you know, my father's from the South. He grew up as a gardener. Um, when he um, ended up in a suburb of Philadelphia, um, the front became this incredible lawn and ornamental effort, and the vegetable garden was hidden in the back, right? So uh, rise of suburbs and lawns. This is um, a victory garden at Fenway. Fenway has um, been sort of like the largest, uh, longest term um, production of victory gardens. Almost done here. So Gardening always happens in our country in response to crisis, right? Like right now, um, interest in gardening is off the charts. We also had that in the late 60s and early 70s. We had a back to land movement. We had the Earth Day and the environmental movement um, and lots of interest in gardening. In the 2000s, we had a resurgence of school garden um, and community garden work in this nation. And of course, the White House garden really um, increased interest. And we had 
wonderful um, nutrition and sort of exercise initiatives. The USDA People's Garden also started just a couple of months after Michelle Obama put the White House Garden in. And the Obama years were really good for local and regional food, right? I mean, you have you Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food. Um, the California Department of Food and Agriculture has like community food security grants during this period. We have a new um, national AmeriCorps program called Food Corps. They're changes in SNAP. Um, this year, it's about coronavirus and other drivers. Um, you know, whatever you guys are planning, you need to do because hunger right now is pretty acute in the U.S. and it's going up very, 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 um, rates are going up very, very quickly um, with the um, federal aid program ending uh, for unemployment, you know, yesterday. Um, I don't even know what we're going to do, but we've seen in this crisis that the system we have now is not working, right? Because, um, you know, like I have friends in Kentucky whose kids get school lunch and their, their district, it's a rural district, and, and the, they did a heroic thing. They had their bus drivers um, deliver breakfast and lunch to the kids, right? But my friend um, Zoomed me and showed me what was in some of these packages. And they were, it was just horrible. It was like processed food, right? And the district was trying, but the, these systems don't work. Our system is fundamentally broken. So here, here's what we are now. We, we need to reset the food system, right? These gardens can make a big effort. And it needs to be driven by social justice. So we need to think about labor and immigration, right? Um, in California, the part of California where I am in right now, um, we've got a huge concentration of COVID cases um, among um, our farm laborers who feed us right? Um, we have issues with workplace conditions and equity along the su supply chain. Um, people that work in, um, you know, meat processing are just, uh, if you're following the news, follow Leah Douglas, Fern News. She's writing about this. I think there are like 50,000 infections that they know of right now um, among uh, sort of, um, you know, agricultural workers. We are seeing the perils of concentration, the sort of um, shortages of food and the challenges of distribution. Um, you know, we need to be looking at diversified cropping systems. We need to look at farming scale and location. We have a new farm crisis now. Who owns the production capacity? You know, um, I'm not a meat eater, but, um, you know, there are probably four companies that control 80% of the meat supply in this country. That's, that's not good. We need to think about access to land, and that's where you can make a big difference, equity and inclusion, if you have access to land because gardening is privileged. Not everyone can have access to land. We need to make land accessible. Um, a recommitment to investment in science um, and, you know, realizing that we're in a permanent crisis now. We have a climate crisis. We have COVID. We have this economic crisis. We have a food crisis. We have a health crisis. And the disparities in um, our country are becoming even more apparent as a result of COVID. And so this is a real challenges for you, but the, the things that you can do provide access to land, provide access to facilities. Um, if you have kitchens in your facilities, give people access to commercial kitchens. Um, you can provide a place to convene uh, conversations, difficult conversations about um, food security and food access in your community and what you're going to do in your community to increase resilience. Um, you can help people um, register for feeding programs. Um, you can help people register to vote. Um, you can build on your tradition of collaboration, provide education and, techno and technical support, and just facilitate gardening. It's critical right now. It's just absolutely critical. So um, really quickly, if you want more information, I've got a website. Um, I also blog on this site. Here's where you can find me on Twitter. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And sorry, I, I went a little over, but um, 
I will um, look forward to questions, anything that you might have right now. Great, thank you so much, Rose. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, if you wanna go ahead and ask your questions in chat, and I'll moderate them over, um, as she's answering questions, I can group ones that might be similar. Um, I also have a few questions here. How can you not? That was an amazing presentation. And there's just so many things um, that can be inspiration to get us going again on a strong local uh, food system. Um, so yeah, I particularly love the idea of engaging the Department of Homeland Security in this. And the idea of kind of flipping that kind of paradigm they're in where it's so much about, um, it seems to me like it's so much about kind of invading privacy and other sorts of things. Um, and I'm just speaking for myself here, but it seems like it could be something that really amps up what Homeland Security means to all of us, which is local food, um, social yep. justice, and all these things. So right. I guess the first question I have is, um, do we have anything like a, a war gardening commission or any kind of part of the USDA? I know you mentioned the USDA People's Garden. I'd be curious to, to hear what that was. Um, and do we have anything like that in office right now that is hopeful from the top down? Yeah, so we don't. So the, the USDA right now is a disaster. The People's Garden is fantastic. And that is at the USDA's headquarters in the Witten Building in Washington, D.C., and um, it's an organic garden. It's on the National Mall. And the USDA is actually the only federal agency that has a presence on the National Mall, which tells you about the importance of agriculture in our country, right? It's pretty front and center. Um, and the, uh, the staff and volunteers keep it running. It's a great effort. And I suspect that if we have um, a change in administration, I actually expect that one of the first things that might happen at the USDA, um, besides undoing all the terrible stuff that's happened is um, to start a national effort because they have that in their DNA. They have that in their DNA, but there's not right now. There's not. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And I, I wonder if you have any interest in, in running for that office when it does open up because I can't think of anyone better to um, head that effort. With oh, you're, you're, you're too kind. Um, you know, I think that there will be um, many young people that could be tapped for that position. And whatever we do, it has to be about diversity and inclusion and very radical um, in fundamental ways about access. You know, flipping some things so that we have access. Great. So we do have a question here from Jennifer um, saying, any ideas for how to raise money for supporting community gardens? Yeah, so um, one of the ways I've been involved in a lot of community gardens, and they're like the best, right? I mean, they're they're just the best. So I I think um, you know obviously you can rent you know your allotments, and you can raise money that way. But you know that's hard because some people don't have money to garden and. Um, we want to make it inclusive. Um, I think that, you know, you might want to look at um, some of the health foundations. So if you, for example, if you have Kaiser in your community, Kaiser has done tons of work um, around gardening and um, uh, sort of like uh, farmers markets at their facilities. And so I would say go, go to health foundations and ask for money. Um, go to companies. Um, if you haven't applied, you know, if you have a really great idea, there might be a Patagonia grant that you could consider. Um, but I, I think that health foundations are going to be good. And I would also say too, I think that, you know, um, our, our, our local governments are going to be starved, right, for sales tax. But this might be a time to go pitch um, your local government about what you can do to sort of ease food security. Um, in, in one of the last um, big economic downturns in the United States, there was a program that emerged called TANF which was temporary aid to needy families. And there have been some derivatives of TANF, um, you know, 
you know, for a long time. But I remember we were able to get a um, collaborate with our county and get a block grant for TANF to do gardening programs for kids in Title I schools. So, you know, don't, don't think that just because you're a local community organization that you couldn't get government funds. I, I think you, you could. Okay, great. And I see Eric raised his hand here um, and he didn't ask his question in chat, but I'm gonna go. Yes, uh, just, uh, just a huge gratitude for what you've put together. Uh, the both of you, and for those that don't know, and I jumped in late, so maybe it's been mentioned, but Matt has a wonderful seasonal planting guard for the garden, uh, planting guide for the coast. So please know about that, and thank you again. Thank you, Eric. And I also want to mention, in response to Jennifer's question, too, we're working with the city of Fort Bragg to start community gardens, and I can tell you that they were in financial trouble before COVID hit. Um, like many cities are and states. Um, and so they're supporting us with resources, but one thing that they're short on is money. So we do have a GoFundMe campaign, um, which I'll post the link for again, and you can email gfcgardensfortbrag at gmail.com. And I'll also write that in and just spread that to anyone you think might be interested in supporting um, community gardening in Fort Bragg. And we're all in it together trying to make this happen. So. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. And another question I had for you, Rose, is we have, um, you know, I keep hearing about all these victory garden movements popping up all over the country and COVID gardens and crisis gardens. And it seems like um, there's so many different things that are coming up on their own um, without needing a strong top-down approach. Um, although a top-down approach would certainly help these things out and support them and make it more efficient, possibly in the rollout of true food security and localization. Um, I'm wondering if you know of any uh, resources or websites that are kind of linking all the good work that people are doing around the country and around the world towards these efforts that could serve as inspiration for other communities? Yeah, so I think that's one of the issues right now, right, is that, um, uh, uh, there isn't like a super strong national network and there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel. Um, and so there isn't a central clearinghouse that I'm aware of, although um, it would be interesting if someone had the, the time and the capacity to start doing like a Google map of of some of these things but um you know there are definitely lots of things going on and and certainly one of the things i would also encourage you to do too is um tap into your local faith community right because um a lot of the um faith communities a lot of the churches they have land um, and they're, you know, typically pretty generous about sharing space with, you know, community organizations, but there are also a number of um, national, you know, denominations that have started um, initiatives, um, you know, like the Episcopal Church um, actually has a national initiative right now where they're rolling out all sorts of gardening stuff. Um, but unfortunately, it's really, or, you know, kind of disorganized. And I agree with you that I think that it should be grassroots. Um, one of the reasons that I argue for sort of like a national umbrella is, is I, I think um, that, you know, the Master Gardener program is actually a USDA program that runs down from the USDA to the land grants. And you have a, a built-in information network in every state and every county through the USDA if you can use it. There is a USDA presence in every county in the United States. And um, so if, if you could use that, the information network as sort of like an information highway, that that would be really good. And one of the arguments I could also make for having at least a national umbrella organization would be really to push for the redeployment of federal and state funding from stupid stuff 
to stuff that's really going to help communities. And if it's grassroots, I think it's harder to do. And so I think you need simultaneously a sort of organizational place where people can find resources, but tap into that grassroots movement. So I think it needs to be both. Great, thank you. Um, so we had a wonderful, and it's still there, it's limping along, but it's a school garden program in Fort Bragg. And it was run by an amazing gardener named Julie Castillo, who's now working for the Noyo Food Forest, which is kind of the, the school garden that formed as a nonprofit that has a relationship with the high school in town. But at one point, for 20 some years, every kid had a gardening class at each week. And they worked with Julie from kindergarten all the way up through going into middle school. And then they kind of graduated into the Noyo Food Forest um, where they had opportunities for internships. They could help run the booth at the farmer's market. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the Fort Bragg Unified School District cut the funding to Julie's position. And, you know, I think I understand and a lot of us understand that they're really tight on funds. Um, we live in a, a, a community where there was um, a booming economy and it crashed. And so we're very underserved. And, um, but anyways, in times where resources might be tight with schools, um, do you see any other avenues that we could help support these school gardens um, beyond just hoping that they realize the importance of these curriculums. Um, you know, maybe it's PTA organizations or, you know, some other kind of ways, but any tools or ideas you have that could help us as a community rally around um, those gardens to get those back as a central part of the education program here. Yeah, I, you know, that's an amazing program you've had. Um, so when I, you know, I was doing school gardens here in Ventura Unified, and, um, and I did um, a gardening program um, at, as a volunteer at a particular elementary school um, for like seven years, eight years. And um, one of, when we really got traction with the program was when the, the PTO saw it and went, this is good. And they liked having their kids, teachers liked having a garden curriculum, you know, available. Um, the parents liked having their kids in the program and where it really got traction was when the parents said, you know, we kind of also went like a farm to school sort of lunch program and the district was really interested in that. And so what they managed to do with the PTOs is the PTOs in the schools that were not Title I, they raised the money and paid for their their equipment and then help subsidize the Title I schools. I think PTOs are a really good place to start. I also think too, you know, your local master gardener organization, you know, there may be, I mean, it's worth talking with them because um, I know that I had master gardener volunteers in my program who loved to do school programs. And um, one of them, Vance Askew, was my partner that whole time through the work. And so he would come out with me every week to do that for years and you know there might be master gardeners it's it's a shame that um that the school district doesn't have the money but i get that yeah i think you know just as we um continue down this road of of un, in, you know kind of unsurety um with whether it's covid climate change all these things we can express or we can expect um stresses on our systems and maybe the old ways of funding things or maybe the value of the dollar um, might not be enough. Um, but I think the, the community having buy-in um, and supporting these projects from a heart place as well as a head place and a, a, a wallet place is key. So just an encouragement to all of us out here in Fort Bragg to really um, support each other through this work. Um, and, you know, we can create this future that we believe in. It's really up to us. And that's what the whole Victory Gardens movement was about. It was about seeing the challenges and rising to the occasion. So yeah, it was. And it's, it's, really, it's really hard right now because, um, I, you know, a lot of the things that I would suggest to you for funding right now, I, I can't even suggest to you because I, I just think we don't even know where we are with the economy, right? We have not 
we have not landed. The, the descent is not done yet. And so um, it's hard to even know what businesses are going to be around, um, you know, post post landscape. I mean, you know, if, if you have a nursery in Fort Bragg and a nursery might be doing very well right now. You know, they might be able to, to pony up some, some money. But I, I think, again, the fundamental problem is I have these conversations with people all over the country all the time. And the fundamental problem is we're all talking about, you know, bake sale type stuff, right, to raise funds. And it's kind of like, well, we, we pay taxes. <laughs> and there are billions of dollars that get spent on things that don't benefit communities. And what do we have to do to organize as gardeners and as communities to advocate for, you know, not just an occasional drop of support here, but what do we have to do to fundamentally shift the system? And also too, you know, what, what, you said about um, Julie Castillo and the, and the program that she did. What do we have to do in this country to make it so that kids are learning about gardening, nutrition, food system, climate change, environment in a spiraled way, which you've described nationally all the way up, you know, through 12th grade and maybe even college? What, what has to change in this country? What can we do? Yeah. Great. Well, it's 12 o'clock. So um, I just wanted to thank you again so much um, for, for helping us as a community envision what our future can be. And um, I think this, this whole concept of Victory Gardens to me um, just feels like such a way to bring everything together. And your wisdom in this and your experience in this um, is priceless to us. And, um, you know, if you're ever up here, and you want to get a glass of kombucha or a juice, we got a great little co-op that makes great juice. Um, and so, yeah, uh, look forward I to I love to. And thank you for having me. I, I've just, Matt, I've enjoyed getting to know you. And I hope that you'll keep me in the loop about, about what you're doing. Because, um, you know, you guys live in a great community. And I, you know, I wish you a lot of luck moving this forward. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, just a reminder for everyone, join us for our next presentation in a few weeks in September. Uh, we're doing a Friday night film series called En Nuestras Manos, which means In New Hands, um, on September 4th, 11th, and 18th. It's a Friday night film series from 7 to 8.30. And join our garden-friendly community network and help us fundraise at our GoFundMe site to start some community gardens here in Fort Bragg. And you can get more information from gfcgardensfortbragg at gmail.com. And definitely pick up Rose's book. It's wonderful. So take care, everybody, and hope to keep in touch. And I'll stick around for a little bit. If anyone has any more questions about Victory Gardens and all that, um, we'd be happy to, to talk more about that. But Rose has left the room. And thank you all for showing up. And Matt, is this, is this recording going to be available?